Welcome everybody. It's so lovely to see so many of you joining, although I can't see you. I can see your initials. Delighted to have you with us. We're just going to give it a minute to allow everyone to join and thank you for waiting so patiently in our virtual lobby. Um, it was really, uh, yeah, it's great to see. We have so many people who are joining us for this event. Um, who knew this subject was so interesting to so many? All of you did, and so did I. So I'm super excited to be with you today. OK, we'll just give it one more minute and just make sure that um, all of those in the lobby have been able to join us. Um, OK, just bear with us. OK, I think we'll uh, kick off. So welcome to this, the first session of our Gender on the Agenda series focused on gender transport and planning. Um, I am delighted to see so many people interested in my two favourite subjects, uh, gender and all things equality, diversity and inclusion and transport, which has been at the heart of my career. So my name is Frances McAndrew. I am the group head of inclusion and responsibility at an organisation called Mott McDonald, who are delighted to be sponsoring this series along with the Urban Transport Group. Um, last time I checked, we had over 700 people registered to attend uh, from across the globe. So um, it is a shame we can't all be literally in the same room. I think there would be a phenomenal buzz. Uh, there'd obviously be brilliant uh, tea, coffee and biscuits. So just imagine that's happening. Um, but yeah, please settle back and enjoy the session. Um, we hope you're going to really enjoy it. I am. So the purpose of the whole series, we've got a series of these events being rolled out, is to challenge the assumptions that some people have had about transport and planning and that it's a gender neutral uh, thing and that it's already inclusive. So I think because you're here, you're probably already aware that that's, that's not true. So how are we going to do that? We're going to look at issues such as different types of journeys that women make and maybe how the sector can respond better to the choices that women are making about their journeys and their transport. All obviously going to look at issues of safety and security in the public realm and on the transport network itself. There are some best practices coming through the series. Um, how do we create inclusive spaces and places, streets, buses, trains, cycling infrastructure that works for everyone, including women and girls? We're going to have to look at my other favourite subjects around data and evidence and how do we understand the gaps that we have and what does that mean and, and what's the the evidence telling us about the needs and travel patterns of women and girls. There'll be a role for innovation and thinking about that and not just around technology um, and then really important you know last but not least how do we as a sector become more diverse because we know if we do that, we'll really strengthen our ability to deliver more inclusive spaces and places. So that's what's to come in the series. I hope some of you will join us for more than one event. Um, and this, the series is being sponsored by the Urban Transport Group, as I mentioned, and Mott McDonald. And for those of you who don't know, Mott McDonald is a global engineering management and development consultancy, but, but one with a difference. So the difference is marked out by the fact that not only are we employee owned, but our purpose is to improve society by considering social outcomes in all we do. And so when we saw the opportunity to work with Landor Links on this series, we jumped at it, particularly because it makes that link between us being an inclusive employer and the way we'll be able to deliver social outcomes and a, a more gender and inclusive transport projects. So that's why we're here. Um, it is important to acknowledge, though, that gender isn't a binary issue. Um, and that many people are looking to us in the transport and planning sector to have a more nuanced and thoughtful response around their needs. Um, and I'm also very conscious of those barriers, inequalities and discrimination that it cuts at the intersections of gender with other issues. And so we, we envisage that during this series, we will be looking at you know, how that works and issues of accessibility, for example. Um, we're using Teams today. Uh, we think it's the most accessible experience for you all as audience members because of things like live captions, but we will welcome your feedback and you'll be getting a, an evaluation questionnaire to tell us how things were for you and any suggestions genuinely welcome. But in similar vein, we're going to look to vary the times, the days 
and the speakers so that you have a, a truly inclusive experience. So look out for that questionnaire and please do fill it in and send us your thoughts. So today, got a fantastic lineup for you. I am so excited to hear from the speakers we've got. Um, and we're going to sort of try and set the scene for the whole series, if you like. Um, and we're going to focus on, you know, that big assumption about gender neutrality and transport and planning. What, what is that and why is that? And, and is that, you know, something we can really unpick and, and deconstruct? Um, how can we better understand, therefore, the gendered travel needs? of the people using our systems and our spaces and places uh, and what needs to change. Um, we're going to hear from each of our speakers in turn in terms of the format of the session. So we're going to hear from Ines Sanchez de Madariaga on the main implications of a gender perspective in transport and the concept that she's coined of mobility and care. And I'm really excited to find out more about that. Tiffany Lamb's going to talk to us about something she'll be able to explain I certainly can't which is the technocratic paradigm so some jargon there but something we will all understand at the end of this session and how that paradigm impacts in transport planning and how it creates gendered impacts and finally Laura Schof on what the hell are we all going to do about it so now we have this information and, and what are we already doing some work I'm sure already going on if you have any questions please do pop them in the chat box. I know you might be used to using Teams to share thoughts, ideas. If you could try and restrict it to questions today, it will really help because I have a support uh, in the audience to help me with kind of picking out all, all the good questions. But yeah, it'd be really helpful to them if we can just put uh, questions in the chat. You're all in listen mode. Sadly, I would love to hear from you all, but um, you can appreciate that would take us a month and uh, you might not have noticed but the event is finishing at 1.15. Um, there is a there was a, a glitch with the system we have to book in half hour slots so uh, it's probably in your diary to 1.30 so we'll either give you the gift of time or you know maybe we'll just overrun a little. So that's everything I hope you'll need to get the best out of this session um, and that takes me to the introductions and we're going to hear from, as I mentioned, Ines Sanchez de Madariaga, the Professor of Urban Planning at Madrid School of Architecture. You'll see a link to all of the biographies for our speakers, but I am so excited because Ines is an internationally recognised expert in everything gender, transport planning, city planning, science technology. She was Director of Women in Science Unit uh, when there was the Spanish presidency of the EU. So, you know, you couldn't have a better speaker to kick off our session. Um, and at this point, I'm going to shut up and hand over to Ines. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Francis, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here with you today and with all these uh, great colleagues on the panel and the many people in the audience. Thank you so much for attending this seminar. Um, I would like to start by um, what, what the organizers have asked me is to provide uh, uh, an overview of what are the gender implications in transportation. So when you look at gender in transportation, uh, the, the, the main topic is to look at what, what, uh, what are the, the gender um, uh, aspects of the city. Uh, uh, and in particular within the city, uh, what are the implications for transportation systems, for mobility, for accessibility. When we look at the city from a gender perspective, we look at the way in which gender roles have implications on the way people use and live the city. And uh, most of these gender roles have to do with uh, the activities that people perform on a daily basis in their daily lives for the support and the reproduction of life. These uh, activities are called care activities and they are mostly statistically uh, performed by women. This is shown by the statistics of the use of time across the world. We also see that the gender gap in, in the use of time and the performing of care activities is not closing significantly with time and, and it's persisted across geographies with some differences. 
So it's uh, the, the gap is closer in some countries than in others, and it's closing relatively, but not very much. So um, what we uh, when we look at the city from this perspective of care tasks, we'll see, and we, we see what people do on a daily basis, we see that people who take care of others and who are responsible for the maintenance of the home, uh, who, as I say, I repeat, are mostly women, they do many tasks around the city. They accompany girls and boys to school, they accompany elderly people to the doctor, uh, they uh, accompany people who cannot move on their own um, to, to, to all kinds of activities, in addition to working in paid employment, uh, as most women today also work in paid employment. So this implies like a double workload uh, in times of in terms of use of time and use of the city, and it implies a more diverse use of the city and, and a different use of transportation system, different mobility patterns, uh, and different possibility of accessing places of employment, places of leisure, and places for self-development as well. Uh, so what, what we see is, uh, when we look at transportation, we see that people who uh, perform care tasks and who also have imp uh, um, uh, a job, uh, uh, use transportation system in more complex way and have a most, more intense youth use of the city. They go from uh, um, from accompanying elderly or younger people to school or to other activities or to the doctor. Then they go to work. They do different errands for the upkeep of the home and so on. Many of these trips are change trips. Uh, and of course, when we look at the way that transportation statistics are collected, we see that many of these tasks uh, and of these trips are categorized under different headings, which in overall terms represent smaller percentages of the number of trips by purpose. Uh, but when you sum them all up, you see that they are quite a significant percentage of, of, of trips, almost as high as those related to employment. Uh, when I realized that, uh, uh, that was uh, over 10 years ago, I, was I received a commission by the Ministry of Public Works here in Spain to analyze transport statistics from a gender point of view. And I realized that all these trips that people would do for the upkeep of the home and for the reproduction of life and the care of others, uh, they were hidden under other headings, under different headings, like visits, like escorting, like other, like shopping, like, um, like visiting, uh, like strolling. Uh, but many of those trips were in fact trips that were not performed for personal reasons, nor for leisure. They were actually performed for the care of others or for the care of the home. And, and then I said, well, we need to give this a name because when you when, to give visibility and to properly take into account and properly quantify the amount of travel that is performed for these purposes, you, you have to give it a name. Otherwise, naming has this power of of uh, of uh, not of creating reality certainly, but of 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 creating a a, a more adequate perception of of what is happening in the real world. So I said uh, I coined this term of mobility of care, which is an umbrella term under which the many trips that people perform under this concept of gender that allows for understanding all these care tasks that people do on their daily living. Um, and then you, you quantify them adequately and you give them a name, uh, uh, then we, we, we can see the way transportation system operates uh, differently. Uh, uh, and we can bring to the forefront the importance of care trips and, 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 and travel carried out by people which are mostly statistical, as I said, women for the care of others and the maintenance of the home. Uh, and so uh, after this, I had the opportunity of devising specific surveys and implementing them uh, to really see what actually these care trips could uh, amount to, how, 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 how numerous they would be. 
And I, uh, I, we did a survey that we applied in the metropolitan region of Madrid. We, uh, we realized a number of other surveys in, in other, in other cities, and uh, and the to be able to uh, empirically quantify. Uh, and, and, and effectively, the result of this uh, empirical work confirmed my initial um, hypothesis that uh, travel um, carried out for the care of others um, that is so intimately linked to gender perspectives on the use of transportation systems and on the use of the city and hence for urban planning as well, because you cannot look at transport without looking also at, at urban planning. They go together, hand in hand. Uh, and so the empirical results showed that, uh, in fact, uh, the amount of travel that was performed for care purposes, the mobility of care, uh, if for many, for certain segments of the population, and also overall, um, it amounted to uh, was significantly very close to uh, travel carried out for employment purposes. And when you uh, took on a sex disaggregated perspective on this and looked at how many of these trips were carried out by women and by men, it was so obvious that most of this travel was carried out by women. In a much with a much higher difference and much higher gap than the gap between men and women in employment travel. So while summarizing this, uh, the empirical evidence shows is that there's a big um, there's a, a significant gender gap in travel for employment purposes, and this gender gap is much bigger in travel for care purposes. So just to summarize this very brief introduction, the mobility of care is this innovative umbrella concept that allows to quantify and make vis visible uh, the travel that people, mostly women, do for the purpose of caring for others and the maintenance of the home and hence for the reproduction of life without which we cannot live nor the economy can function. Uh, so it can carry a different perspective to the understanding of how uh, transportation systems are uh, designed, uh, how transportation policies are defined, are devised, and, and transportation systems are also managed. For instance, even when looking at, at more specific issues such as pricing policies um, is an aspect to look at. And then, of course, there are other implications of a gender perspective on transportation, uh, such as safety or ergonomy, because we have different body sizes and different uh, physical strength. Uh, and, and some other issues that relate to intersectionality regarding, for instance, to age, um, and, and other issues uh, that, of course, bring, uh, come in, into the picture, such as economic status, which is also in many countries very interlinked with racial issues uh, and, and also with, with, with cultural and religious, religion issues can also come into the picture uh, uh, in the international comparison. So I will just leave it here and I'm looking forward to further um, conversations uh, in the Q and A uh, part of the panel. Thank you so much. A huge A thank huge you, thing. Guinness. Yes. I feel incredibly um, in awe of the work, and also a little embarrassed. We've given you ten minutes to summarise your life's work. Um, I encourage any of you who can to to look at Ennis's work in more detail, and I uh, hope that has given you a taster of the vast amount of knowledge and expertise that we've been able to tap into today. So um, I'm conscious some of you may be having problems posting questions. Um, I've asked for someone in the background to have a look at that. So if you are, uh, hold them in your minds or on your paper, on your notebooks, and uh, we'll make sure that you can uh, post questions before we get to that part of this session. So huge thank you to Innes, and again, you will be able to uh, ask questions when we've heard from all of our speakers. So, uh, thank you, thank you Innes. Uh, we're going to move on to our second speaker, uh, and our 
second speaker is Tiffany Lam, uh, who is a global expert on gender and cycling and is currently working with the city of Bogota on gender analysis of new cycling infrastructure, as well as working with Sustrans on uh, inclusive design and healthy streets in the city I've spent my career working on in London. Uh, and Tiffany is a consultant with the New Economics Foundation as well, leading their work on the future of cities, urban mobility, issues of the 15 minute city, the Green New Deal, and gender inclusive uh, cities. So over to you, Tiffany. Thank you, Francis. It was really interesting to hear more about the mobility of care from Ines, which is certainly way more important um, in terms of the COVID recovery. Um, and I am going to speak to the technocratic paradigm in transport policy and planning and how that produces gendered impacts both in the workforce, in the transport sector, and in um, outcomes that we experience on transport systems. So what do I mean by the technocratic paradigm? So a technocratic framing is a perspective that prioritizes quantitative data and emphasizes science, technology, engineering, and economics. And when things are framed in a technocratic manner, like transport is, it makes it really difficult for considerations around gender, diversity, and social inclusion to seem relevant because they are not economic, engineering, technological, or like scientific issues. So they're perceived as irrelevant. And it makes it really difficult to get more diversity in the sector just because science, technology, engineering, and economics are not very diverse sectors themselves. So I will first speak to the implications of the technocratic paradigm in transport planning in the process of designing transport systems. So there is a huge lack of diversity in the STEM fields. Um, in the UK, women make up only 24% of the STEM workforce. And when we look at transport planning, just the transport sector, in Europe, women make up just 22% of the workforce. In the UK, this figure is 21%. And globally, it's more or less um, a grim outlook. Women are very underrepresented in the transport workforce. And male-dominated fields tend to come along with a macho culture in which women do not always feel respected or treated as equals. And the all-party parliamentary group conducted research on perceptions and experiences of women in the transport sector in the UK. 93% of them felt that transport is typically viewed as a male-dominated industry and it has an image problem. 69% said that the transport sector has a very macho culture, uh, the status quo and just the way things are done is very male oriented. And um, only 19% of people felt that women and men are treated equally in the sector. And some women commented that even if there are women in senior roles, they don't really have that much clout. So in terms of outcomes, there are gendered experiences of using transport systems that result because of the way transport is framed as a highly technical field that requires mainly scientific, technological, engineering, or economic solutions rather than considerations of diversity and inclusion. And one way this manifests is in the radial planning uh, that is so typical of how transport systems are designed. Um, many transport systems mainly just focus on optimizing longer distance commutes, uh, radio journeys from the uh, urban peripheries into city centers or business zones during peak hours. And this is premised on the historic idea of the male breadwinner. And as Ines mentioned earlier, this kind of transport planning does not really enable 
mobility of care type of journeys. Uh, so radio planning disadvantages those with more varied journeys, like women and non-binary people, children, teenagers, older people, and informal workers. Another issue or another way in which this manifests is um, safety considerations are not a technical issue and therefore tend to get overlooked in the design of transport systems, which results in public transport systems being very dangerous places for women and girls um, and non-binary people. So in the UK, 86% of women aged 18 to 24 and 71% of women of all ages have been sexually harassed in public space, including on public transport. It's just an everyday experience. 66% of girls in the UK have experienced sexual harassment in public, and they report adopting tactics to try to avoid it as if it's something that they could prevent, like um, walking with headphones on so that people don't talk to them or crossing the street when they perceive threats or taking longer routes, getting off earlier or um, later than the actual stop that they need to get off at. And in the UK, London has the highest rates of public sexual harassment. 40% of sexual assaults occur in public spaces, particularly on the transport network and 55% of women in London have been sexually harassed on public transport, especially the tube. So transport systems become very hostile environments for women because their safety considerations and concerns are not integrated in the process of designing transport systems. So if we want to go beyond the technocratic paradigm, there are two main things that need to happen at the same time. The first is the transport sector needs to diversify from within. And the second thing is that there has to be more gender expertise in the transport sector because it's not just about adding more women or people of color or people with disabilities and expecting outcomes to be more equal. There has to be more diversity at the same time as knowledge, expertise on how to actively create inclusive environments. And in terms of increasing diversity, mentorship programs and particularly sponsorship programs, which are less common but more effective, are ways to increase diversity in the sector. And as for gender expertise, there are some existing tools out there like um, equality impact assessments, gender safety audits, and accessibility audits, which um, exist but aren't used as often as they could be to ensure more equitable and inclusive outcomes. And I'm sure Laura will talk more about what we can do. So that's all for me for now. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, I'm sure everybody enjoyed that and, and is much more uh, understanding of what a technocratic paradigm is. And I'll be sure to drop that into a conversation this week. So, But much uh, more interesting was all of the content. And uh, like you, I am a massive fan of equality impact assessments. If anyone's ever worked, uh, had the, 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 I'm trying to think of the word, has everyone, anyone's ever worked with me, they are something that I heavily rely on to make change happen. So um, yeah, really interesting to hear all of your perspectives. Um, okay, um, I again, encourage you to post any questions in the chat function. Um, we believe it's working now, so uh, all should be OK. And uh, if you haven't posted any, maybe start to think about what would be some great questions for our panel. I know, like me, you're probably just in awe listening to everything they're saying. So we're going to come to our last speaker. Uh, delighted to welcome Laura Shove, who is mm -hmm. uh, chair of the Urban Transport Group and also interim chief executive of the West Midlands Combined Authority has previously been Managing Director of Transport for West Midlands, where I'm told Laura was responsible for expanding and integrating the region's roads, rail, bus and tram systems, and somehow managed to get a £4 billion budget. So I'm sure um, that's the thing we'd all like to know more about, but that's not exactly what she's going to talk about today. So Laura's going to talk to us about what the hell we do about all of this uh, gender information we've just been given. So over to you, Laura. That's great. Thank you, Francis. <clears throat> Can I just say um, what a privilege it is to be sat alongside um, 
such esteemed other speakers who are absolutely expert um, in their field. And, and first and foremost, I think, especially given what we've just seen, I don't intend to debate the facts about whether or not there is a gender gap. I think that um, our, our colleagues have made that clear. And certainly all you have to do is look at the research online to show you that that's the case. Um, so so I, I can tell you I can experience it too, because uh, although I don't have a British accent, I have lived here for uh, two decades and I remember uh, very clearly taking my uh, ch my child in a pushchair from the West Midlands to London to go to the embassy to register his birth. Uh, and you need to make no other journey but that to understand some of the challenges uh, that women face on our network. Um, and having grown up in New York City uh, in the 1980s, I can assure you uh, that uh, flashing was a regular occurrence back then. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, and, and certainly I'm one of those statistics uh, as well. Um, but I'm also very proud to be the very first female chair of the Urban Transport Group. Um, and, and I believe actually the, the first woman to run a transport authority in England. Um, and that is a role I take uh, really seriously. And the fact that it's taken this long um, tells us quite a few things. So what I wanna talk about is what are we gonna do about this? So. Um, you know, the previous speaker was very clear, we need to diversify and we need to share expertise and I, and I couldn't agree more. So for the here and now, what can we do? And I'll tell you just some of the things that we're looking at doing, some of the things that our best practice and our partners up and down the country have pointed us towards. There was a fantastic slide up earlier that pointed towards TFL, who as ever are um, often the leaders in trying to make real inroads in some of this. And I'm I'm privileged that they sit alongside me at the UTG and that their learning is something that we can share up in the country. And apologies, bear with me, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, and, 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 and as we just discussed, every scheme needs to be reviewed, right? And that's not when it's finished. That is when it's an early phase of design. And we need to be asking ourselves a whole host of questions. Um, and that is not only how will that scheme look and feel to a whole host of users, and that's the Equalities Impact Assessment, but being really specific about some more of the detail. We know that, that there's a big issue about safety. So what does this do for lighting? What does it do for safety by design? Where are the accessible points? How do people make sure that they know that they are being seen or, or feel seen by other passengers? What's the ambiance like? How does that feel? And then really importantly, and something I think often gets forgotten, if you do build this scheme, how is it going to be cleaned? How is it going to be maintained? So many schemes start off with really good intentions and they don't think through the entire sort of life cycle of the project. Um, and within six months, a place that used to be an exemplar project is now a place that might look or feel or be unsafe um, in a way that was not intended. The other challenge and one um, as an organization who operates a system, so we run our light rail system here, we really also need to think about how does it work for the people who have to operate the system? So we have a number of uh, customer service representatives. They go out on our trams from early morning to late at night. So it's our duty to sit down, both as we're designing new schemes, but also to sit down with them as the people who work on the coal face of this and understand how does it feel to be a woman ticket expector in uh, Birmingham City Center at 11 o'clock at night on a Friday? Um, and do they feel safe in doing their jobs? Are we are we making sure that they do? Um, and if they don't, what can we do about it? So do we look at rostering? Do we look at buddying up? Because it's really important that our staff as and our users um, feel safe. Uh, someone I used to work with used to joke that um, that older women make the best bus drivers uh, because they treat the passengers uh, like the grandkids and the grandkids, they, the passengers treat them like, uh, like a grandparent. Um, and then you start to wonder, well, why are there so few female bus drivers? Um, and mostly because I absolutely promised Francis I would use the word um, at a really real basic level, it's to do with um, accessibility to, to toilets and facilities. Um, we don't even think those things through on basic levels about planning routes to allow um, women to take those kind of jobs. And women have different needs than men, and we need to absolutely 
um, address that. One of the things that I'm most proud about um, at, in the West Midlands is we have a voluntary partnership between um, British Transport Police, the West Midlands Police and ourselves, which is called the Safer Travel Police. And they're based here in our building and they use our CCTV up on our sixth floor. Um, and they go out and they target hotspots where we know that we either have issues around safety or the perception of safety um, on our network or where we have fewer passengers who might need more care. And they add that sort of extra visible support um, and again, our operators and the people who work for us have a direct line to them. So when they need them or they anticipate they need them, um, um, that's big help. And um, certainly our, our customers tell us how much safer they feel when uniformed people are on their um, services. And that's not just to say the police. Um, the same goes with the fire service. So one of our great challenges is how do we get uh, more firemen and firewomen who are, you know, who are going to work and in uniform to take public transport because there's something very comforting to all passengers about about seeing that. So it's from the beginning of a of a concept of an idea and working that through, collectively testing it against a set of criteria and and not agreeing to build something that is substandard in any way, shape, or form. Um, and something else that I'm working on that I'm I'm really proud of is is the transport minister Rachel McLean has asked. Uh, a colleague and I to lead a, a task force to look at what we can do about violence against women on public transport um, and to pull together a set of recommendations about how we can keep women safer on public transport. And that's a key bit of it. And certainly colleagues spoke about why that is so important, particularly for women. Um, and then finally, I just wanna talk about planning for the future. Um, so I don't like to think of myself as a, as, and I don't know why, but I don't like to think of myself as a transport professional because I think what transport does is connect people with places. And I think we, in a way, we talk about transport in, in all the wrong ways. Um, so my background is in urban planning and um, I'll, I'll tell you how I wound up in this career, which was I was sitting in my apartment in New York City working in a totally different sector uh, one night having um, a few glasses of wine to, uh, as, as I was prone to do when I was quite a bit younger. Um, and somebody had stuck through the letterbox, the catalog for New York University, which was you know about three inches thick from undergrad to graduate. And I was just looking through it um, apropos of nothing. And I saw something about the waterfront of New York City. And I thought, oh, that's actually really interesting. And then something about how do you take an 18 mile island and get all the waste off of it, you know, and all the construction waste and how do you move people on and off the, the island? And I thought, it's absolutely fascinating to me. How do you make, how do we make New York City work? And then I looked up and it was something called urban planning. Never heard of it. Absolutely never heard of it in my life. Didn't think it was something I, it, nothing introduced to me. So um, anyway, by a fluke, I thought, actually, I'd really be interested in that. And, and then went ahead to pursue a career. So that's by accident, not by design. And why don't we talk about transport as something that is more about social justice? You know, actually, if you want to condemn a place to poverty, what you would do would be to take away its transport networks. You know, transport is an enabler of so many other things um, to happen, whether people are accessing a job or schooling or a family or friends or socialization. Um, and if we talked about transport in that way and stopped talking about uh, chassis and bogies and timetables um, and making it seem like something that was out of reach to somebody whose pure goal in life was just to help make everybody else's life better where they live. I think we do a much better job of diversifying our workforce um, and that will take time um, and it takes time for women to understand that that's what it does and to come through those channels but that's what we really have to do so that's uh, that is my commitment to the people on the call, but it's also my ask of you, which is let's think about how we talk about these careers and how we make them more appealing to everybody. Um, because you really don't have to know, um, you know, what the chassis is on the 323 in order to genuinely have a career in transport and make a difference in people's lives where you live. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Just some thoughts from me on what the hell we're going to do about it. Thank you, Francis. A huge thank you, Laura. Um, 
Yeah, really inspiring. And it sparked a thought in me um, about why I chose this career. So I was happily working at Amnesty International when I got a call from Network Rail, who I thought must have got the wrong Francis. Um, And the recruiter on the phone just skillfully slipped into the conversation that transport was about connecting people to jobs. Uh, and I was sold and uh, yeah, had a fantastic um, career move then into transport, worked at Network Rail, worked at Transport for London and worked for the Mayor of London on his diversity and inclusion strategy. So um, yeah, we're going to uh, welcome back the panel. A huge thank you to Laura for that inspiration. Um, if I could ask all of my fantastic panel to pop your cameras back on, um, I believe we've almost fixed our chat issue if you still have a question and can't seem to post it uh, apparently if you go back via the browser and rejoin the session you do get access to the chat so um, have a look if that's your um, challenge and if you've got a burning question please re-enter the session via the browser hope that's clear if you still haven't got uh, a way to ask questions we've kindly been given the uh, email of one of our organisers who's kindly offered to allow me to uh, read it out to you uh, should you want to email us some questions. So it's Juliana, J-U-L-I-A-N-A, this is always a difficult thing to do isn't it, juliana.o'rourke, O-R-O-U-R-K-E, at landor, that's landor.co.uk and someone will pop that in the chat bar as well. So you can do that. Apologies for anyone who's got one of those questions. So in the meantime, I just wanted to ask um, the panel sort of building on what we just heard about what was your own personal kind of motivation around joining this sector? I've shared with you a little bit of mine, the kind of, um, you know, the joining people to jobs um, and it really aligned with my values. If I um, could just ask, Laura shared a little bit of her, her why did she think this would be a great career? Because obviously we've heard that it's the lack of representation in some ways is driving some of the issues, not all, but some of the issues that we experience in the sector. So, um, Ines, do you mind if I ask you about your your personal motivation for joining, joining this sector? Well, I I had this in Spain. Planning is part of architecture, so it's very linked. It's a bit different from the UK. It's more linked to transforming the built environment, and it's part of architecture. It's a bit uh, more f further away from the social sciences and policy than it is in in the in the Anglo-Saxon Anglo world. Uh, so I wanted to be an architect since I was a, li a little child because architects for me united um, uh, scientific and artistic issues together. Uh, uh, so I liked mathematics and I also liked drawing and I liked the humanities and art. So architecture seemed to have everything in it. And then within architecture, uh, when I finished my career, uh, I decided to go into planning specifically after I finished, because I had specialized in building design, but I moved to planning because I had this interest in, uh, in people uh, and, and how the built environment serves people's lives uh, and how it can contribute or not <laughs> to the quality of life of persons. Uh, so that was my main motivation for uh, and housing was a very important part of that because uh, I realized how important housing was uh, and, and, and I had this interest also in policy. So that, that was what was behind my uh, specializing in urban planning. Fantastic. But then there's one thing about how I got into gender issues, which was when I was a student in New York City at Columbia University in 1990. 
that was already over 30 years ago, I saw there was a, a subject, uh, there was a seminar called Women and Architecture. And uh, I, I thought, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> and I poked in and I said, oh, this is very interesting. Uh, and then, I, and that stayed in my mind. And then when I came back to Spain and I started my professional career, the, when I had first the possibility to start uh, independent research, th this was the first thing I did was to get funding to do research on women in architecture and planning. And this was the first academic research on planning and architecture and women in Spain. That was uh, in 1999. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. That really resonates with really resonates. thinking as well. So, uh, yeah, really, really good to hear that. Tiffany. Do you mind me asking what, what drew you to this sector? Sure. Um, so I was actually working at a public interest law firm in Washington, D.C. Um, I was working the Civil Rights and Employment Practice Group and working on uh, large class action lawsuits against uh, companies like Walmart for sex discrimination and um, fast food giants like McDonald's for wage and hour violations and workplace harassment. And I started um, cycling partly because I wanted to go to yoga classes in the morning before work. And just from where I live to the yoga studio I wanted to go to, it was like a 45 minute journey on the metro or a 15 minute bike ride. And um, I decided that I would start cycling just as a mode of transport to try to save money and go to law school. And um, I just got roped into cycling advocacy. One of my good friends was really involved with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. And she kept telling me like, all of the volunteers are men and they're like men who ride in triathlons and they're super competitive. They're always talking about their fancy road bikes and like mechanics and all the specificities about their bikes and chains. And we just need normal people like you who cycle to save money, to talk to people about how accessible and normal cycling can be. Um, and I just got, yeah, ripped into cycling advocacy and just riding a bike around a hyper segregated city like DC just made me think about or see very clearly how a lot of like the lawsuits I was working on, um, those issues around structural discrimination are very spatial and very embodied experiences as well that you can see and feel very tangibly as you move around the city. And I it was just an interesting moment when I felt like everything that I was working on in my professional life like came to life in like 3D around me as I just cycled around the city to go to work, to go see friends, to go to yoga, to do just everyday things. And um, that led me to London where I did my master's at um, LC Cities in Urban Planning or City Design and Social Science. Those stories so powerful, um, and I think if there's any recruiters on the phone, if you could just pick all the essence of that, um, we would sell this industry to, uh, and we would have a gender balance overnight. But um, yeah, until we can clone the panel, uh, we've got a bit more work to do. Um, a huge mm -hmm. thank you to Anna for persevering and getting your question to us. And um, she's really interested in uh, the 20 mile an hour uh, work that's going on um, in some cities. And uh, is it kind of sees it as a huge enabler for women and anyone vulnerable. What does the panel think about um, 20 mile an hour limits as normal road speed? like has been agreed for Wales, Scotland and, and 25 miles, I think that means, sorry, reading the questions, in the UK. So uh, your thoughts and ideas around the, the benefits of a 20 mile an hour speed limit, I think, uh, yeah. Um, coming first to uh, Tiffany, if you don't mind, are you happy mm -hmm. to share your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely am in favor of reduced speed limits because they just make streets safer for all road users. And um, I think in addition to reducing speed limits and enforcing 20, 20 mile per hour zones, well, I, I, that's the key thing, just having to enforce that as well, because um, 
most frequently cyclists and pedestrians will complain about speeding drivers making um, roads feel more unsafe. Um, and yeah, I think it's important to reduce speed limits, but it's also important to enforce them because a sign won't do much if it's not really something that uh, drivers will adopt in practice. Thank you, Tiffany. Ines, did you want to come in on that point? Yeah, I, I'm totally in agreement that um, a speed limit is uh, the right policy in many contexts, uh, particularly at the neighbourhood level, uh, uh, because it reduces uh, dangers and, uh, uh, and I mean, there's no need to hurry within neighbourhoods. Uh, so uh, I absolutely support this as, as a one of the key uh, one aspect. I mean, because this has this is a, anything that relates to improving gender aspects in transportation has multiple um, uh, dimensions, uh, but speed limits it's certainly one. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Laura, any thoughts on twenty mile an hour zones and speed limits? You will get a wildly different from version uh, of that from me, um, as long as they're in the right places and they need to be designed well to make sure that they're around the right spaces. But um, I think what was interesting, um, just to add something different to that bit of a conversation, is we did a lot of communicating with people um, at three different points during the pandemic um, and asked all sorts of questions. But one of those questions um, was, you know, what's been good? What would you like to keep if, if, you know, if you could keep anything from this? And we had so many people respond to us about how, f how many fewer cars there were on the road, how much safer they felt walking and cycling, how many more people were out uh, in those spaces with their communities taking advantage of that. Um, and it would be a real shame, I think, to, to lose it, as Ines says, you know, at some point, the past two years have changed a lot of the way that we live. What is, you know, what is this massive busting rush? Um, you know, and how do we capture some of the some of the only good things that came out of a global pandemic, which was about making streets better and safer for all of the users instead of the traditional um, hierarchy, which puts the individual car user at the top. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And building on that, we've had a question from the audience around the not at all controversial and difficult to implement low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, and, um, you know, whether you're uh, panel members and Innes, forgive me if the, the UK centric jargon doesn't land, but, you know, in particular parts of the UK in response to COVID, we've had the permission to implement very low traffic areas of cities with specific restrictions that are quite new and new powers for local authorities. and. And the question is really, how can we better incorporate a gender perspective into those low traffic neighbourhoods that have seen sort of restrictions on what streets you can use, how you can use them with safety in mind uh, and with encouraging healthy, active travel in mind, but um, have also potentially for some created difficulties getting shorter journeys done, dropping off with access needs, delivering caring responsibilities on certain streets. So. Yeah, um, I think it would be really helpful if any of the panel have any thoughts on low traffic neighbourhoods and gender. Um, mm -hmm. Just come off mute because I don't feel it's fair to pick on any one of you on a quite difficult subject. Uh, sure, so I am in favour of low traffic neighbourhoods and there is a lot more evidence coming in now from the monitoring schemes which have shown that they have increased cycling and reduced driving. They've also increased walking. Um, I think it's important that as low traffic neighborhoods continue to be evaluated and monitored, that there is data collected on cycling diversity as well as cycling volumes, because more cycling does not equal more diversity. And there was a transport for quality of life report out recently that looked at two um, low traffic neighborhoods in South London, and they monitored cycling diversity. In one of the low traffic neighborhoods, I think in Dulwich, there was a strong increase, or a really sharp increase in women and children cycling to and from school. 
um, and that drove a lot of the increase in cycling. And in another low traffic neighborhood in Walworth, there was a huge increase in delivery cyclists using the low traffic neighborhoods to cycle around for their deliveries. And um, in this instance, there was less diversity in terms of gender and age because 96% or so of the delivery cyclists were men um, in their 20s or 30s. Uh, however, it's a good sign that uh, the low traffic neighborhood was able to serve more marginalized uh, cyclists who are often left out of decisions about cycling infrastructure and uh, wider street interventions. So it's really important to understand who is using the uh, low traffic neighborhoods and how to get a sense of the impact on equalities and um, inclusion. And I would also say that it's important that low traffic neighborhoods are considered and delivered as just one of many other interventions that function as a network to create a joined up approach to healthy and safe walking and cycling routes. Um, so other interventions could be things like school streets um, or just more protected cycle lanes, more pedestrianization projects, things like that. Thanks, Tiffany. And just to probe you a little, do you think this is some, some it's a leading question, by the way, do you think this is a place where impact assessments could come into their own a little? Is there, because people are in the chat and questions are used asking for tools and techniques and how can we actually do this stuff? Um, do you think that this is a place where something like an impact assessment could help? Absolutely. And, um, I know that you support the equality impact assessment as well. And I agree they are underused and they could be really well used to understand the impact of low traffic neighborhoods on um, disabled people, for example, um, or just anyone making an encumbered journey where they have to carry other people or things. Um, so yeah, definitely, I'd like to see EIAs being used a lot more. Thank you. If I if I may may uh, have a comment on this, uh, we have here in in Spain we have gender impact assessment as a requirement uh, for uh, all planning instruments. So all plans, either it is transportation or urban development plans, uh, they are required to integrate a gender impact assessment, uh, and so this is uh, starting to really introduce a, a, an important change in professional practices as, as this requirement is, is being implemented at, or is being take, starting to, to take a hold on, on, on the workings of, of planning departments and also on, on the professional side. Thank you, Ines. And Laura, anything you wanted to add there? Uh, only that um, just yesterday we rolled out a trial mobility hub um, in, in in our conurbation to try to see what that does when you think about it differently, bring things together differently. I think it's important that we recognize that not everything we try is necessarily going to be right the first time. And it's just really important that as professionals, we're encouraging ourselves to try things and fail and learn from them and try again and make them better. Um, and I think that, you know, if we can start to incorporate that in some of our thinking, we won't be shy about saying, gosh, we didn't get that right the first time, but let's go back and try to fix it now. And let's go back and try to improve it. Whereas I often feel like when we don't get things right, we just say, oh, well, we didn't necessarily get that right. We'll try better next time. And things that don't go in perfectly the first time can be fixed. Things mm -hmm. that have a secondary impact you don't notice or anticipate don't have to remain that way. So we also can't be afraid to to try and fail and learn and change tack as long as we're always coming back to the principles of what are we trying to achieve with this scheme? And one of those principles must be about how it feels for women. Thank you, Laura. And um, to me, at the heart of some of that um, ability to have that insight is data and it's come through in our questions as well. And um, It'd be interesting to hear from uh, all of you how you think we can get better data in the sector, uh, gendered data and intersectional data that can 
give us those insights. You've all based your work on gender and data, and it'd be really interesting to know, you know, any hot tips, any useful information for those who are on the call. There is a specific question which I need to read because um, it is actually um, from someone who is far more expert than I on data and asks if you know of any any good transport data models that really look at data um, and they're saying that the most flow data is disconnected from data about who is cycling. That probably makes more sense to transport planners than it does to me. Apologies to the question asker. Apologies, Caroline, if I haven't uh, done that properly. But I guess overall, your thoughts on how we can get better data. And I suppose the question is really that's really useful to help us make better decisions and to deliver more inclusive infrastructure. Ines, any thoughts on data? I know your whole model in Madrid started yeah. with data. Yes, well, I think there are a number of issues. You, we know that transportation data sets are normally uh, thought of from the point of view of the need of the agency, of the transport agency creating the, the, the data. And normally transport agencies, uh, their main um, focus is on transport infrastructure. This is why uh, um, travel uh, on foot and, and bike travel and, and, and travel that is not um, uh, that is related to, to gender issues or to care activities is not taking into consideration adequately. Um, uh, many many transportation uh, uh, data sets don't include uh, travel on foot because it's not relevant for transport infrastructure investment. Uh, many times uh, trips of less than 10 minutes or less than one kilometers are not taken into account. All these trips are very gendered. Uh, and they take out, they leave out a lot of travel made by women. And then trade chaining is not easy to take into account adequately. Um, uh, and the diversity of women's use of, 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 of women travel, it makes for more complex understandings of, of movement in the city. Uh, this is what happens always when you get when you try to do gender analysis in any field. It's more complex, <laughs> and, and this runs against efficiency and against cost, uh, and against uh, thinking of how to take into all this flexible and diversity and 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 uh, and uh, diverse and changing ways of using systems. It's it's less regular. It has more uncertainty. More. Um, it's more unpredictable. So bringing all this into account, uh, this, these patterns are m much more complex. So uh, getting gender, uh, getting rid of gender bias and gender omissions, uh, uh, it, it implies like shifting the point of view. It implies uh, uh, and then uh, being more careful uh, be, uh, designing more complex and longer, longer service and interviews. So it will be. Um, uh, so uh, and, and until now, this is I don't know any place where this is done in a consistent basis. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's a, a whole. Um, I mean, a whole field for um, for innovating here and and for for creating models that can better reflect. Uh, the way women move in urban and metropolitan areas. Um, yes, uh, <laughs> but it can be done. It can be done, certainly. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ines. Laura. Just to, just to make a quick comment on that. Um, gosh, if there's one thing that's changing every day, it's data. Uh, who owns it, who stores it, who sells it, and what it tells us. So. I completely agree. There's a there's a, a whole big wide world around data innovation, um, but also we can do more, certainly as operators, to make it easy for the people who use the system to tell us what they think. You'd be surprised how infrequently people ask people actually what they think, and there are digital ways to do that to make that really easy for passengers. And of course, you know, when you can have a, 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 a world class system, as this happens around the world, but we don't yet have up and down this country where people are sort of tapping in and tapping out and you understand the data of who is traveling when, where, why and how. That's much, much, much more insightful than the sort of travel data we're able to gather um, here. But setting up online 
um, forums and, and setting up um, digital engagement, digital citizen engagement um, is something as transport authorities, I don't think we have all done as well as we could. And actually, um, it'd be rem it's, it's remarkable what people will tell you when you ask them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think someone's built on your points in the question. So Tiffany, if I come to you, they were, they're also asking about your kind of the radial model that actually sometimes the data and the insights we get from talking to different people need to go f much further up the pipeline of planning. So, you know, we can look at how we make gender decisions way down into kind of how we put a low traffic neighbourhood in. But is there, a, um, Angela's asking about, you know, is there not a case for at the very heart and the initial part of the thinking about what we build and what our major infrastructure priorities are that we also have a gender lens and we use the data more there so um i don't know if you've got any thoughts on data more generally but also how do we put it more upstream to to get better investment decisions yeah i think that's a great question and a really urgent issue in um planning more inclusive and sustainable transport systems i think one of the key things really is just invest in more robust data collection. Um, so just thinking of cycling infrastructure data collection, which is currently really poor, um, some things that are relatively easy and cheap to do are um, implementing uh, cycle counters or cameras that just count people cycling. And again, that tells you how many people are cycling in a particular area, but that doesn't tell you who is cycling. Um, it doesn't give you a picture, or it doesn't disaggregate data by gender, ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status, things that would be more helpful to understand to create inclusive cycling networks. So really the main thing to do is invest in the time and skills it requires to get that level of data collection and disaggregation and building on what Laura was saying, it's really important to consider lived experience as a valid source of data as well. Um, just because it's not quantitative doesn't make it any less relevant. And it's really important to understand how people experience transport systems. And that should really be more incorporated in how we think about and plan mobility networks. Yeah. and. Um you, you've kindly brought us to that area of kind of qualitative insights and how do you get the lived experiences of anyone who doesn't define as a man into the system? It would be interesting to hear from the panel on your views. We're going to have a whole other event on how do we make this sector more diverse. So um, uh, I know this is a massive topic that many of the audience are interested in, but just in terms of how do we bring more diverse voices into the planning room, the transport room, any thoughts on how we can engage so we make those decisions in a more inclusive fashion, not just with the data, but with the voices of those with lived experience who don't define as men in the room influencing our thinking. Any any thoughts about that? Uh, Tiffany, are you happy to carry on? Uh, sure. So I think it's really important to do more meaningful community engagement. Um, we can do consultations and create digital platforms for people to feed in, but they may not be accessible for or used by all people. Um, so I think one important thing in getting more people to share their lived experiences of transport systems and public spaces is to think more seriously about compensating people for their input because if lived experience is a valuable source of data people may not all be able to give up an hour of their day to talk to you about where they went that day how they felt as they were walking or waiting for the bus or driving or whatever and it's really important that um, people who share their lived experiences feel that that is valued and that it's good use of their time. And again, some people, more privileged people, will be happy to give up their time and give feedback on um, cycling networks or uh, public spaces, public transport systems. But people who may be more dependent on public transport uh, for socioeconomic reasons or spatial deprivation, um, spatial isolation, 
may not have the luxury of time to just sit down and talk for an hour or so. Um, so it's really important to make people feel valued and that they are a source of expertise. Thanks, Stephanie, some really good points there. Ines, any thoughts on getting that lived experience in the room? Yes, I think there are several aspects to this. Uh, the first one is what T was Tiffany was saying, which is about participation and consultation uh, made with a gender perspective so that uh, you ensure that, we, that you are reaching to women because in participatory processes, women are busy Year, they have less time, uh, so it's not always that easy to have them participating on an equal basis in part in participatory processes. So this has to be done with a gender perspective as well. So that would be one aspect: participatory and consultation issues. The second would be to get women in decision-making positions, uh, which uh, uh, implies having them in transportation agenda at agencies and in planning bodies and in in municipal councils and all through throughout the decision making chain in the transportation and planning um, at all levels of government and this requires of course uh, different measures of public policy to promote equality between women and men in decision making and in politics uh, including quotas, including gender equality plans of organizations, including all sorts of measures to promote structural change for a better balanced representation of men and women in decision making. And then I would say a third aspect uh, addresses the participation of women into the technical professions uh, and the technical staff and the professional bodies, not the decision making also, but also the professional, both in public and private sector. And this implies from promoting women into the STEM fields in, of engineering in, in which transportation education is, is given and, and have more transportation engineers and women and more female, more women represented, more women across the spectrum of the planning areas in which that impact uh, transport and planning. Uh, in education and then into the prof into professional development because we know that there's a big gap in the integration of women engineers and planners uh, after education is finished <laughs> and so you also need uh, to develop um, gender equality plans i'm at this moment drafting a gender equality plan for the professional association of spanish architects that uh, it's an umbrella organization for, for architects in Spain, and I'm working on a gender equality plan for the profession of architecture in Spain. So these sort of things. Thank you. <laughs> Laura. I don't think there's much I can add, except don't expect everyone to come to you. If you want to know what people think, sometimes you need to go to them. I'll make it on their time in the time that they have, um, and as opposed to you know, set up a focus group that needs to come to your office, you know, between nine and five and and that does just doesn't suit everybody. So the the onus doesn't can't be on as I think Tiffany was implying them for them, you know, to do the work. You know, we're the organizations. It's our responsibility to plan it. We need to organize ourselves differently. And while I have you, Laura, because I've just realized you've gone last in almost every question and had to, you know, not have the joy of going first. Um as our last question, really, a lot of people have asked about how 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 do those outside the sector influence maybe the customers of the sector, if you like, uh, people that travel, um, who how, how can they influence those in the sector to do more to make the kind of journeys uh, more gender inclusive? And I suppose in your career, it's kind of the questions have also been about how do we influence those who don't have this lived experience, kind of uh, those who define as men in positions of power, um, and maybe are not yet aware of things like mobility of care and the technocratic paradigm. You know, how do we influence? How do we get this call to have ten thousand members next time? Um, so, any thoughts, Laura, on how how you have influenced others to to get this stuff, or how others on the call could start influencing more? Well, we'll keep. I mean, everyone needs to keep talking about it, right? Um, one of the most powerful things that I did on a station site visit. Um, was with a, with a group of people that were encouraging us to understand how it would feel for people who are visually impaired. Um, they blindfolded us and they asked us to navigate the station. It was absolutely terrifying, um, you know, and at some level you don't see things that you don't see. So 
you know, if, 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 if like we have to share what that lived experience feels like, you know, try honest to God, try to get a, a, a push chair on a bus and you'll see why women didn't design buses. You know, it's not an easy thing um, to do. And there are ways to do that that bring everybody together. Everybody knows that the best systems include everybody. And I think everybody wants to achieve that. Um, you know, and I don't think it's a debate about whether we should do it. The evidence is really clear. We absolutely must do it. So, you know, I would suggest if you have a, a comment, I would if you if you have, live in the West Midlands and you've got something to say about the system, you should email me. I, I get emails all day long from people and I, I try to point them in the right direction or answer their questions and and get it sorted. And, you know, you don't have to go to a customer service team. You've got Google. Figure out who it is you want to talk to and ask how you can get involved. Um, and then there is something in the back of my mind, which is probably a terrible idea, but I'll say it anyway, but it would be so great. W w one thing I wish I had was time to go to schools. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if we could get people from across the profession to go into schools and advocate for it as a profession for everybody, you know, even if every organization could give somebody a half a day off a year to go into a school and talk about why they're so proud people who work here they don't do it for the money they can they can go earn money at a at, you know another consultancy firm they work here because they want they, they're so passionate about making the place they live a better place and if yeah. we could sort of get that in front of young students i think it would be really powerful couldn't agree more laura and uh, one of our questions suggests that while we're there we'd also get some amazing insights from those young people about how they experience transport um, and the some of their fears and worries and concerns and and also what they love about it. So yeah, um, I, I think that's a flipping good idea. Um, Ines, your last thoughts on how you've influenced others to get this, or how people who are in the audience could could start influencing more to make this stuff happen. Well, I think that each there are so many people in the audience sitting from different perspectives. So uh, I, I, I think that uh, each one from their positions uh, and within their scope of action in their professional work uh, can have an impact within what they do on a daily basis. And then as citizens and users, uh, I mean, Laura has already told us quite a bit of the things that can be done. Uh, uh, but I, I would say that just this this event today is an example of, of the big impact that organizing these sort of webinars can have. Uh, so speaking about it, uh, it really will change, a, it will produce, it will contribute to a change of mindset and and will impact a public agenda. So that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that already. Since I started working on these topics over 20 years ago, I see an enormous change. Yeah. And uh, this uh, webinar like this, like this would have been impossible only five years ago. Yeah. And so we, we are seeing enormous change already. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right now, more than ever, we have this amazing opportunity to reframe how we see cities and transport. So we didn't, none of us asked for this opportunity that a pandemic brought, but my goodness, should we seize it? Um, Tiffany, any last thoughts on how we can influence? Uh, yeah, I would say to just put transport on the agenda. Um, so in debates or discussions about the housing crisis and the need for more affordable housing, what about transport? Are there safe, accessible and affordable transport links to get people from these new homes to places they need to go? Uh, in discussions about local economic development, talk about transport. Is there a transport system that works to get people to jobs or to schools um, or to business centers where they can contribute to economic activity? I think too often transport um, is, or many sectors operate in silos um, and there should be a more joined up approach because transport is essentially about how people get around. It's about connecting people to people, to other places, to opportunities, and just giving people the right to participate in public life. And that has to be relevant in discussions about virtually every aspect of public life. Thank you, Tiffany. So there we have it. We've concluded our time together. We have given you an action, if you didn't hear it, Go and talk about this to anyone and everyone you know you work with. Um, 
it's really, really crucial that we all take our, our part in this. Um, a huge thank you to the speakers. I am in awe of all of your expertise and your hard work and all of the ways in which you're making this happen. Uh, obviously, thanks to Landor Links for putting the series together and getting us all here today. But of course, most importantly for all of you for coming along, we know you're interested in this and that secretly and quietly and sometimes loudly and not that um, secretly, you're doing your stuff, you're making this happen. You wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, there is a recording. Um, I probably never listened to it. I don't know about you, but listening to the sound of your own voice is has got to be one of the most excruciating experiences. But um, I encourage you to share it with those who haven't been able to join us that you maybe want to influence, you know, maybe this is a good place to start. And as I mentioned, an evaluation form to tell us all the ways in which we can improve and the ways in which the series can develop. If we haven't covered your question, I'm so sorry. We will use them though to think about what we do in future seminars and the hot topics that you've got on your minds to help inform the future events. My hope is that in working together on this, in sharing our ideas, challenges, we can actually use this as an opportunity to improve sector-wide collaboration. Um, and I think if we do that, we can deliver more inclusive transport for the communities we serve. So thank you for joining us. I hope you found it interesting and useful. I certainly did, uh, selfishly. So um, yeah, have a great afternoon. Look after yourselves and thanks for joining us.